All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Assemble Plus. My name is Jonathan. Of course, it is Wednesday. That means it is the weekly poll time. Today, we're going to talk about last week's Beta Ray Bill because I got it late. We're going to talk about Thanos Quest. We're going to talk about Star Wars The Bounty Hunters. And of course, we're talking about Heroes Reborn. So if you want to skip to the end of the video where I talk about Heroes Reborn, go right for it. But we're going to talk about Star Wars Bounty Hunters right now. And what I thought about this book being my first Star Wars comic ever. Now, don't get me wrong. I actually enjoy Star Wars a lot. I enjoy the movies, the TV shows. I enjoy the video games. So I actually enjoy the IP, the worlds they create. Uh, you know, Swartor is one of my favorite games on PC. So I do enjoy the world. With that being said, I really enjoyed this comic. And it kind of makes me wonder why I'm not reading more Star Wars stuff, to be honest with you. The comic is set between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and follows Boba Fett after he has Han Solo frozen in carbonite taking him to Jabba the Hutt. Now, basically what happens in the story is that the Carbonite is kind of not 100% and there's a risk to losing Han Solo, which means Boba Fett doesn't get paid. So because of that, Boba Fett has to go see a doctor or someone who's more specialized in Carbonite to get it fixed. But of course, it's never that easy. You know, the doctor's like, I need the money. But if you don't have the money, which Boba doesn't, you can go do this for me. And it turns into kind of this whole big thing where Boba Fett has to fight all these warriors in order to beat the top one. And then once he beats the top one, you know, he gets a huge payout, takes it to the doctor. And there you go. Right. So what you get out of this is a very simple story. But. The art is great. The action is great. Boba Fett is a character is really well done. This is following Boba Fett's appearance in The Mandalorian, which a lot of people loved. I think if you love that, you should love this book. You really should. I think the characterization of Boba Fett's there. And I think more than anything, people really like to see Boba Fett. I think he's just one of those characters that people really have an attachment to. And, you know, seeing him kind of take up the mantle of Jango for this, obviously he doesn't want to show the armor right he, to him he even says it himself this armor means something like it's it you can't just use this armor in spectator fighting like this right so he understands the meaning of the armor which you know for anyone who kind of looks at the mandalorian you understand that he knows that right there's a special attachment to that armor taking up the name Django, right which was his father's name and then having a flashback to the scene in geonosis it's a good little callback there so in all honesty guys the book is really well done you know, then you get to the end of the book and, you know, obviously the doctor has been killed. Han Solo has been stolen. And because of that, basically, you know, now it's going to be this whole chase to get, you know, Han Solo back and then obviously taking the job of the hut. So it kind of fills in the gaps a little bit of between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And honestly, if if I'm going to be 100 percent honest with you, this makes me want to read more Star Wars. If this is the quality I should expect out of a Star Wars book. I should be diving deep head first into the rest of the lineup because in all honesty, I wasn't expecting something this good and I got something really good. And because of that, I'm actually going to start picking the rest of these up as they come out now. So shout out to the whole team who put this book together from the writers to, to the editorial staff, to the people who are working on the art. Like everyone came together to make a really good book. The writing, the story, the plot, the art the direction like it was so good so honestly shout out to you guys out there who made this book because for someone who was very skeptical about picking up a star wars book even though i like the world i came out and said i need to read more so um if this isn't on your poll list guys and you're kind of tangentially interested in star wars i would say put this on your list you know there's no crazy jedi stuff or force stuff it's just like a good old-fashioned kind of story set down in the world and bounty hunters and you know mortal combat fighting you know essentially it's it's kind of funny how everything is kind of doing this like stage tournament stuff right you have it in mortal combat that just came out then robin and then shang chi is going to have some of that and now this like i think like the the whole spectator sport thing is really coming back around and this is just another case of it so without saying too much more of what i've already said if you're interested go pick this up where good books are sold and that's what I got for War of the Bounty Hunters. Okay, so next we're going to talk about Thanos Quest. Now, this is a reprint of Thanos Quest number one and two from 1990, and basically follows his journey of assembling the Infinity Gems for the Infinity Gauntlet. So, in all honesty, if you've already read these books, you're not getting anything new. You're just basically getting the story in an updated format. The art's the same. Everything's the same. It's just kind of like a reprint. But with that being said, 
I think there's something to be said for kind of the nostalgia value of what these stories provide, right? Whether you want to take a trip back in time to appreciate the art or the storytelling. I mean, it at the end of the day, it's a good Thanos story, and it's there's really nothing wrong with that, to be quite honest with you. I mean, when you think about Jim Starlin and all the books that he's written and all the love that he gets for the stories he's written, how could you not want to pick this up? And to be quite honest with you, I picked it up and at the comic book shop and I was like, this is pretty thick. Like, it's pretty much half a trade, right? So I was like, wow, this is like pretty thick. And for someone who's never read these books before, it was kind of cool to kind of take a dip in there and be like, oh, these were really cool. This was a really cool story. But if you already have Thanos Quest 1 and 2 or if you read them on Marvel Unlimited or you have them digitally, it's probably not something for you unless you're a total collector. But with that being said, obviously... There's some nostalgia there, and because of that, it's hard to, to deny that this probably is a pretty good pickup for anyone who wants to collect those old things. So, obviously, kudos to Marvel for kind of putting it out, and because of that, I'd like to see what else they do. You know, between this and then the Marvels, they're really trying to reach back and talk about old stories and, you know, filling in the gaps in some places and really trying to lean back into what used to be some of the more forgotten eras of comics. So, and... and in following that tone, I would like to see what comes next after this one. And depending on which characters or which storylines they're going to pull from, I can see myself picking up more of these style books because the value is there. You know, there, this was insane value. Like, it is pretty thick. It had great story. And honestly, fan favorite character, fan favorite storyline, why not pick this up, right? So for me, this was cool. But depending on the circumstances around this book, it may not be for you. So got to be careful on that one. Okay, so the next book is Beta Ray Bill number two. Now, to be completely honest with you, I was a big fan of Beta Ray Bill number one. And I really thought that was a great book. Now, with that being said, I thought this was kind of weaker on the front half and got stronger on the back half. So... On the front half, with the introduction of Scourge, I don't necessarily know much of Scourge from the comics realm. I only know him from Thor Ragnarok. So it felt like the characterization was very closely associated with him from the movie. So I thought that was pretty on point. Now, if that's not true to how he is in the comics, then oh boy, right? So with that being said, obviously, you know, this was all about Bill finding Odin in order for Odin to make a new hammer. And then it takes you to this bar and Odin is working there. He's kind of gone off the grid. And I thought that was kind of weak. You know, it didn't really seem like an Odin thing to do. Kind of like go to a bar and be a bartender. So I was like, okay, sure. And then once Odin tells Bill where to go, I thought that's where it started getting a little better, right? Obviously going to use Sorter's sword to kind of wield that for the power that it has. Cool idea. Having Bill go to Moosephalium, that's cool, right? And honestly, I, I can understand why Pip and Scourge are a part of the crew. I have no issue with them being a part of the crew. But I feel like it takes away a lot of the strength that Beta Ray Bill number one had. It was a very Bill-focused book. And because of that, I felt like it was a lot of Scourge and a lot of Pip in this one. And to be fair, maybe the dynamic gets a little bit better as we go on here. But the way the book kind of sets up what they're doing is very exciting. It's very cool to see what's going to happen. Is Bill going to wield this sword? You know, the sword of the entity that destroyed his homeworld. There's a lot there, actually. Um, and I think there's a there's a really good kind of story that to be told there, right? You know, Bill wants to be normal so bad. He's even going to this length to kind of win back that normalcy, right? So with that being said, there's obviously a lot there to be explored. And, you know, ideally they are going to keep going with this. The end where Scuttlebutt becomes like a droid instead of just being like a ship AI. Okay, sure. Let's see where that goes. But to be quite fair and honest with you, I did think this was weaker than number one. But the back half kind of redeemed the front half, to be quite honest with you. So in all honesty, if number three and on is more like the front half than the back half, then I'm really going to be disappointed with the way they're going but if the back half is more the direction that they want to take the story a little more serious a little more darker like there's reason to believe that's probably where they're going so because of that i think it remains to be seen where the story goes but i'm hopeful that it continues in the direction of number one and the back half of number two and not so much the fun kind of oh scourge is here and he wants guns and so on and so forth of number one and then odin and whatever like Give me the serious stuff and leave the kind of cheesy corniness stuff out of the book. So 
With that being said, obviously, this is from last week, and I liked it. I mean, I like Beta Ray Bill. I like the character. I kind of like the journey he's on, the journey of self-discovery, finding who he is again, like trying to find new meaning in his life. Like, I like that stuff. Um, hopefully the payoff at the end of it is better than kind of what we got out of this book in particular. So would I recommend this? Yeah. If you like number one, I think the back half of number two redeems itself. And I think ideally where they're taking this book should be exciting for the people who are excited for Beta Ray Bill and his journey through the Marvel universe right now. All right, guys. So next on the list is Carnage, Black, White, and Blood. I've been saying red for the past few videos, but it is blood even though it looks red, right? So obviously, as part of the this series of books, there are three short stories that take place. I've been confused with the kind of the format of the books. You know, there's been some real good stories. There's been some real bad stories. And some of the stories I would have loved to see them move forward with instead of kind of the format they're in. But I'm taking it as it is and not what I want it to be. So with that being said, obviously, the three stories this week were pretty good, all things considered. The first one is Carnage kind of massacring this kind of band and everyone there and with one of the guys kind of um, surviving. And there's a little bit of survivor's guilt at play there, too. And Carnage maybe kind of messing around with the guy's mind a little bit there. And because of that, the guy actually kind of commits suicide and burns the whole building down. And even when Spider-Man tries to rescue him, he still goes back in. And it's just like, it's a, it's an interesting look of the mind and how the mind can play tricks on you. And the PTSD associated with surviving something that maybe you think you shouldn't have. And kind of the over, kind of like the anxiety of, you know, Carnage himself coming after you, if so be it, right? So that was an interesting story. It was very dark, to be quite honest with you. Um, a lot of these stories, you know, granted, it is a Carnage story. So let's, you know, kind of take it for what it is here. Um, but they have been pretty dark, all things considered. There's been this one. And then the next one where, you know, it kind of takes them back where Carnage is like the captain of a ship and they're going after the treasure and the treasure is the symbiote. And then once he gets the symbiote, basically he slaughters everyone. And it's a kind of, um, it's an old school take. And then the kind of Admiral, I believe Eddie Brock was kind of fights back and he blows the ship up and he says, I'll see you in hell. And like, that was a pretty good story. It was probably the weaker one, to be honest with you. Um, and then the next one actually is that they're at a comic con and there's some people who dress up as Carnage and these kind of cultists take the people who are dressing up as cult as Carnage and sacrifices them for Carnage. And then it turns out actually that they were never summoning Carnage or anything like that. And then Carnage kills the cultists and then he doesn't actually kill the three extras who were just kind of standing there watching. He's just kind of like, okay, good costumes, guys. And then he basically just kind of walks in and says, now where do I get some real food? That was kind of a dark kind of story as well. But that was actually a pretty good story, right? I, I kind of like when there's a more modern take on Carnage, both the first and the third stories kind of being a little more modern take with him rather than kind of going back into the past with these like weird kind of pseudo stories and like what if adventures or whatever. Um, so because of that, I think the first and the third stories were really good, but they were very, very dark. Like the first one is very dark. Um, so I don't recommend it for everybody because it's not meant for everybody in that sense. Right. Um, if you like carnage, if you like dark stories, if you enjoy kind of like the more mental aspect of what carnage can do to somebody, I would say definitely pick this up, but be very wary of the stories inside because they are not for everybody. Um, but once again, like the art was super good, even though it's black and white and no colors on it, it's still a really good art. It still shows everything. Like the only art you get to see is carnage himself to make him stand out amongst everybody else that are black and white. So you get this full red detail, which is really good, mind you. But with that being said, it is a very dark book, but it's still a good book if you can appreciate it for that. So, um, kudos to everyone who wrote the stories once again. The first and the third one are probably the two stronger stories with the second one. Eh, not the greatest. But if you want to see like this weird take on like the master and commander, you know, or the carnage or is like the captain, you know, Cletus is like the captain. Then I mean like sure. I mean have at it, right? It's a still a pretty decent story, all things considered. But um to me it just didn't stand up to the first and the third one. So but with that being said, guys, that is Carnage Black, White, and Blood number three.
All right, guys, so last but certainly not least is the book everyone's been waiting for, Heroes Reborn. Now, in my humble opinion, and it's very humble, I thought this was a great first issue. I think making Blade the main character of this issue and what could be the rest of this event is so good, man. Blade's finally getting his time to shine, and I really am all for it. You know, having Blade join the Avengers was kind of like an interesting kind of, you know, approach to it. But I'm starting to see the payoff here. Blade's such a cool character, and making him kind of the only one that remembers the world for what it was is such an interesting move by Jason Aaron and the team here that I really hope people take to it. The book itself is really good. You know, obviously sets up all these alternate villains. It really sets up that the Squadron Supreme of America know exactly what has happened, but they're keeping it secret because this is their world now. I want to know what exactly happened and how the world was kind of changed to what it is. But you see so many cool things happen, right? Doctor Doom with the Gemma Sidorak. You see Black Skull. You see Thanos with the Infinity Rings. Like, there's so much there, actually, that... I'm actually excited to see how this world kind of plays out and how they're going to take everything back, for example, from this world, right? Whether it's Blade having to go search for Captain America, whether it's Thor coming to grips with him actually being a god and, you know, the lightning or whatever. You know, there's so much there, actually, that I think we're going to start seeing this move very quickly rather than very slowly. And I think that's a good thing. I think for for everything that this book could do, it could draw this on for, you know, five, six or seven issues until all of a sudden the heroes come back. But with Blade recognizing that he has to go get Captain America and then once Captain America is rescued, that's kind of the catalyst for kind of everything moving forward. I think it was a good kind of move to kind of make that happen quickly rather than kind of Blade spending an, an issue talking with Thor, for example, or Tony and trying to convince them. So with that being said, I think what they have here is a solid start. What I'm more interested in is how all the tie-ins are going to work. So say, for example, next week you have Shatterbug, for example, right? So that's the Spider-Man tie-in. Or then you have the Squadron Supreme of America tie-in, right? So all these different tie-ins are going to tell these alternate universe stories. But how are these all going to kind of wrap themselves up right is this something that's being affected by mephisto for example or is this something that's kind of an outside force outside of that that the squadron supreme and colson kind of made a deal with right thinking about the way this book kind of framed everything colson's now the president like colson has won so much over the last you know few books in avengers that it seems like he was probably the one that made the deal right you know i imagine there was a deal where like we can get rid of the Avengers. You could be president. The Squadron Supreme of America could be the, the greatest team out there. And I think Colson would make that deal, if not be the one to engineer that deal. So honestly, there's so much here that was done right. Blade being the main character, the kind of alternate takes on the villains, the Squadron Supreme of America really got some cool moments to shine here. And I actually kind of like them, right? Blade kind of rescuing Captain America, Thor coming to his senses, right? Now we're going to start seeing what happens with She-Hulk and what happened with Bruce. We know Bruce has now been banished to the negative zone. Is Bruce going to make a comeback in this? Like what happens with Peter Parker in, in the tie-in next week, right? So in all honesty, guys, I think for an event, a number one kind of event, and this was like the first issue, it kind of does things pretty well, all things considered. So honestly, I hope these books come out in rapid succession. I think the number two is next week, for example. I really don't want to wait months and months and months to kind of finish off these books because I'm hooked in on this story. I want to see how this story goes. And to be quite honest with you, I think this has potential to be one of the better events that Marvel's put out recently, probably still under King and Black. But I think this has, you know, depending on how Jason Aaron navigates this, this could be a really defining moment for his run in Avengers and his run overall of the last few years. So with that being said, guys, what would I rank Heroes Reborn? Ah, probably like a 4 out of 5, 4.5 out of 5. I'm just such a sucker for Blade that I think Blade kind of coming to grips with this world is not what he thinks it is. Him coming to blows with Nighthawk um, and understanding that Nighthawk knows that this world isn't what it is. He knows there's something sinister at play here. And because of that, I really want to see where he takes this story and what he does next. So with that being said, guys, obviously that was a pretty busy week in comics. Unfortunately, I didn't get X-Men Curse of the Man thing sold out everywhere, which is crazy. 
So that'll be a part of next week's weekly, weekly poll. But with that being said, guys, obviously, thank you guys so much for hanging out and watching this video. Once again, Heroes Reborn, good book. Please go buy it. Please go support it because, um, honestly, this is probably one of the better books I've read in the last little while. And I think depending on how the next few issues pull out, how the next few tie-ins move, I think there's real potential here for a great story that centers around kind of a bunch of different things. Real quickly, guys, I feel like I have so much to say about this book, but we know the Squadron Supreme has been kind of building up to something really big. We know that the Avengers have kind of taken notice of that. And for the last little bit in the Avengers run, we know that there's been kind of a buildup here between these two teams. I really see the Squadron Supreme getting their butt kicked at the end of this run and kind of the Avengers saying, like, it's time to throw down with you guys, right? So I'm really excited. I'm super excited to see what Blade does with Cap and how he kind of tells Cap everything. Because imagine unearthing Cap in the Prime Universe and being like, hey, Cap, like, you're waking up after 70 years. Like, this is kind of what's happened. And now, like, Blade has to wake Cap up and say, this is what's happened. But the world has changed as well. Good luck with that conversation, Blade. But... That's one of the things I'm, I'm hooked on. I'm hooked on that. So with that being said, man, what a great start. And uh, I can't wait to read next week. Like, holy moly, man. I will see you guys next week for more Heroes Are Born, man. Um, we got a lot of stuff to talk about next week. We're doing another Spider-Man book this week. Obviously, Spider-Man also came out this week, but I'm not caught up. So I got to start pumping those out as quick as possible. So stay tuned to the Assemble Plus channel for a lot more Spider-Man content coming as well as weekly polls, and I will see you guys very soon. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and I'll see you guys next time here. Later.